CMBA criminal law section as well as the Young Lawyers Division. And I'd like to welcome everyone to another installment of our monthly Hot Talk series. Uh, this series, held the second Tuesday of every month, is designed to be a one-hour civil exchange of ideas between our speakers and, most importantly, the audience. Uh, every month we focus on a different topic ripped right from the headlines. But today we are here to discuss State Issue 1, which is on the ballot for the November 6th election. Issue 1, according to the measure's text, was designed to reduce the number of people in state prisons for low-level nonviolent crimes such as drug possession and non-criminal probation violations. The initiative would make the possession, obtainment, and use of drugs no more than a misdemeanor with sentences not exceeding probation for a first or second offense. Issue one would not change the classification of first, second, or third degree drug-related felonies, such as the sale, distribution, or trafficking of drugs. The initiative would also allow individuals serving convictions higher than a misdemeanor for possession, obtainment, and use of drugs to petition the court for resentencing. Uh, courts would be prohibited from ordering that persons on probation for felonies be sent to prison for non-criminal probation violations. The ballot initiative would require the DRC, Ohio Department of Rehabilitation and Correction, to grant an inmate with sentence credits of 0.5 days for each day that the person participated in rehabilitative work or other educational programs. The ballot initiative would require that state funds saved due to a reduction of inmates resulting from the initiative's implementation be spent on a myriad of programs catering towards substance abuse treatment, crime victims, probation, graduated responses, and rehabilitation. Our speakers today are Ohio Supreme Court Justice Paul Pfeiffer and Ms. Elizabeth Bonham of the ACLU. Starting with Justice Pfeiffer, his first job after graduating Ohio State's law school was as an assistant attorney general uh, trying eminent domain cases associated with the building of Ohio's highway system. In 1972, he became a partner in the law firm of Corey Brown and Pfeiffer, where he practiced primarily as a trial and tax lawyer for 20 years. He also served several years as an assistant county prosecutor. Justice Pfeiffer served in both houses of the Ohio General Assembly, including one term in the House of Representatives and four terms in the Senate. He held a variety of leadership posts in the Senate and served as a chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee for 10 years. His proudest legislative accomplishment was crafting the legislation creating the Ohio Tuition Trust Authority. Justice Pfeiffer was elected to the Ohio Supreme Court in 1992 and served for 24 years. For him, the most inspiring thing about the court is that every voice gets heard, from that of the widow fighting for her husband's workers' compensation benefits to those of corporations battling over tens of million dollars. Currently, Justice Pfeiffer is the executive director of the Ohio Judicial Conference, and we are honored to have him here today. Uh, Elizabeth Bonham is a staff attorney with the ACLU of Ohio. Her constitutional and federal statutory litigation practice has included high impact work on voting rights, LGBTQ equality, disability rights, protester rights, and police reform. In her current work, she is devoted to ending mass incarceration. Elizabeth is a proud graduate of the Cleveland Marshall College of Law. She is also an urban farmer and activist in Cleveland. She serves on the boards of the New Agrarian Center and Legal Works Clinics and is a member of the National Lawyers Guild. First, we will hear from both speakers on their respective positions, and then we'll open it up for questions. Starting with Justice Pfeiffer, please explain why you believe Ohioans should vote no on issue one. Well, first and foremost, uh, the uh, most compelling reason to vote no is this is a constitutional amendment. It places, uh, it tends to place in the Constitution criminal justice policy uh, that needs to be exclusively the product of legislative action. Now, you may not like the Ohio legislature, you may think they're dumber than a box of rocks, you, I, I don't care what you think, it's still the place that matters like this need to be resolved because they can be changed when they don't work. So from a pure, uh, sit from the standpoint of any student of the Constitution and the structure of government, um, something uh, 
this massive, it's like seven pages single typed in the one section of the Constitution, in the miscellaneous section of the Constitution. It just doesn't belong there. It can't be changed. Um, and it, it will it will be a mess if it passes. Now let me get to the specifics. Uh, first and foremost, as uh, Brad said, a talking point of the proponents is that this only impacts low in low level non-violent offenders and we're going to we've got way too many of those people we have mass incarceration of those people but can be further from the truth let me just give you a couple of numbers first let me give you the level of felon that is in presently in our prison population january 1st of this year, the census for the entire prison population, men and women, 49,512. You want to know how many are in on fifth degree felonies, the lowest level? 2,275. Next level up, fourth, fourth degree felonies, 3,340. So roughly 5,600 out of the 49,000 are in for low level felonies. Now, the other suggestion is that, oh, we're, we're locking up all the, the, the folks who are just possessing drugs, not the traffickers. And to, that we have mass incarceration, not offering treatment to folks who uh, are addicted to drugs. Again, just positively not true. Give you the statistics. Summary from again January 1st. Let's just talk about drug, drug offenses. Now, how many are in for drug possession? We only have two drug statutes in Ohio drug possession and drug trafficking. We don't have possession with intent to sell. So for drug possession, January 1, 2,688 people. For drug trafficking, 3,096. Now of that drug possession, that includes all levels of felonies. So if you are in possession, if you're part of possession of above the bulk amount, um, that gets you up to a penalty that it could be a felony one, two, or three. And the Department of Corrections doesn't break this out, but they, in talking with their staff, they indicated that most of the folks that would be in just on a possession charge would be in for the bulk amounts. It would be a fairly small number of that 2,600 that's actually in for possession of just small amounts of, of drugs. Also included in that number would be those who were sent to prison because they violated the terms of their probation. Now, I, we keep hearing from the proponents, oh, they're sending massive numbers of folks in for uh, no criminal <coughs> violation at all. It's just because they didn't show up for their probation officer or they, uh, you know, whatever it is that they want to say was a low, low uh, impact uh, violation. Again, that's not true. First of all, if you get to sent, sent to prison for a probation violation, you did commit a crime. You committed a crime that is a felony. And what happened to you is when you were in front of the judge, because you might be young age, didn't have a bad record when you were in front of the judge, um, and it was not a violent offense for which there was mandatory prison time, the judge said, okay, Mr. Jones, Ms. Smith, uh, I'm gonna give you a break today. I'm gonna put you on probation with the following conditions. So if you'll agree to those, I won't send you to prison. And usually, if, 
if we're talking about drug offenders, it is that you have to get treatment, you have to be tested periodically, you have to do a number of things. And it, the judges are only sending to prison folks who were given a break and who persistently violate the terms of their probation. So again, it's a very small number. So the business about mass incarceration is just, um, it's just false. There's no other way to say it. Um, now, this amendment does more than just address what should be the drug offenses in the future. It takes down all drug possession charges. As I said, there's two kinds of charges where drugs are involved. Trafficking, to prove trafficking, you have to prove that the person sold or attempted to sell the drug. Otherwise, it's a possession charge. That's it. And this amendment would take all drug possession charges for all kinds of drugs, heroin, fentanyl, uh, cocaine, you name it, takes them all down to a misdemeanor. And it also says you can't even get jail for the first two convictions within a 24 month period. All the judge can do is put you on probation, order you into treatment. And if you violate, the judge can't send you to prison or anywhere else. Uh, that's it. That's the sanction. Uh, we submit that's, that's dangerous. And it removes the tools that the judges use when they have addicts in front of them to guide the person into treatment. Uh, judges are not looking to lock up drug addicts across the state. That's not what they do. They try to get them help. They try to get them into treatment. And the way they get them into treatment, again, is to say, Jim, today you've, you've got some choices. I can send you to prison. I can. Uh, send you to jail, or I can put you in a treatment program. Now, what's it going to be? Are you ready to accept treatment? Because treatment is hard. Uh, and uh, the judges will tell you, uh, there are a lot of folks say, oh, you know, give me jail, give me prison. That's easier than, than going through the treatment program. Now, the other uh, false claim is that treatment is not available. And the uh, as you know, the proponents have a lot of money. They had $4 million from the Zuckerberg you know, Chan Foundation and from the Soros Foundation to get the signatures. It looks like they're going to spend another 6 to $10 million in advertising to try and sell this bad package to the people of Ohio. Um, but I, I just want to deal again with the dishonesty that we're having to, to deal with. They have a grieving father up on television. Perhaps you've seen it. A sad case. He lost his son to addiction. And he says, you know, if my son could have just gotten treatment earlier instead of punishment, maybe he'd be here today. Well, that's, that's, we all feel sorry for him. But that's not what happened to his son. His son was through the courts three times. The first couple of times were sex charges mixed with drugs. And he was ordered to uh, have drug testing, ordered to report periodically for uh, drug testing, ordered for an evaluation. He was eventually put in the program. I knew immediately when I saw that ad and saw where the father lived. It couldn't be true, not what they were trying to portray, uh, because he lives in, the father lives in Summit County, which has one of the most robust treatment programs available anywhere in this state. Eventually he was put through a drug court type of uh, treatment, graduated from that, sadly died six or eight months later. Uh, he died because he wouldn't accept what they were trying to train him to do, and that is to leave <laughs> drugs behind and make it a pass, something new pass. It's a tragedy that unfolds day after day in the state. Almost 5,000 last year lost their drive, life to drug abuse. But this amendment does nothing, nothing to push anyone into treatment. It says, oh, we'll take some money and we'll have more treatment. Well, it's, it's like uh, 
the movie uh, that Kevin Costner was in. And if you build it, they will come. Well, if you build it, no, they won't come. As the uh, head of the Oriana House, Jim Lawrence said to me, I, when I asked him, I said, well, yeah, are you, can people not get in? And what do you do when someone, uh, when your beds are full? He said, okay, the full will send them to a hospital initially if somebody comes to us, but they don't walk in. They get here three ways, family, employer, or the judge. This amendment takes away the most important access for addicts into treatment, and that is the judge. Because as you know, for so many, family support, support maybe never existed. And if it did exist, it's gone because the, the drug addict has been stealing from everybody in the family, stealing from the neighbors, and the family just said, we're done. The uh, employer, often not in the picture because by the time people have descended into serious addiction, they can't maintain employment. So it at leaves the judge, and this amendment takes away the, the tools that a judge would have to guide an addict into treatment. Now, as I said, this thing does nothing, nothing about stopping the flow of drugs. We, nobody can know for sure, but I, I think common sense would indicate if you take all of the penalties for possessing these dangerous drugs down to a misdemeanor for which you can't go to jail, there's a high probability that the drugs are going to flow even freer across this state. One only needs to look to California. Um, as uh, one of your uh, uh, esteemed lawyers here in Cuyahoga County said to me, taking constitutional advice from California is like asking Dr. Kevorkian for uh, senior care advice. Um, California has made a mess of their constitution. But their Prop 47, which this is patterned after, was not a constitutional amendment. It was a legislative amendment, amendment changing the statutes, not the Constitution of California. And just over the weekend, I'm told there, I haven't seen them, but I, I saw the lead into it. Wall Street Journal and the New York Times both did articles on what a mess, <laughs> what a literal mess it is in California now with drug addicts just laying in the streets. Uh, it's, it's, it's just bad. And if this passes, we would hope that it doesn't happen in Ohio. But there's nothing, nothing in this that stops the flow of drugs into Ohio, and nothing in it that moves anyone into treatment. And it takes away the ability of judges to move addicts to treatment. Thank you. Thank you, Justice Biden. Ms. Bonham? On behalf, of the, on behalf of the ACLU, Ms. Bonham, uh, why should Ohioans vote yes on issue one? Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Justice Piper. Um, so I, I'd like to tell you all really what issue one does, because I think that there's a lot of rhetoric out there about it, a lot of fear out there about it. Um, and what I want you to walk away with today, even if I can't convince you, is uh, understanding the two things. What this does is it addresses a current problem that we're having with mass incarceration and with the drug crisis. We're not on the precipice of a problem here, right? We're having it. We're seeing it in our communities every day. And that's why hundreds of thousands of Ohioans who know what's happening in their communities have come together to get this onto the ballot. And the second thing is that, like Justice Piper was saying, this isn't going to open the doors of the prisons and let everybody out. This is going to meaningfully affect the lives of thousands of people in, in, in the immediate future. Um, but what it's also going to do is it's going to start helping us create a model of criminal justice in our communities that doesn't think about the criminal justice system as locking people up and erasing them, but that looks at the criminal justice system as a meaningful way to help people with reform and rehabilitation and accountability and keep them in our communities and not in the prisons and jails that are overcrowded in Ohio. So I, I want to tell you what issue one does. It does, basically it does four things. 
The first thing he does is it expands uh, the earned credit that folks who are incarcerated can earn towards their prison sentence now. And this is something that we have in Ohio right now, earned credit, and this is something that went through the General Assembly, so it's not a radical idea. Right now, uh, if you're one of the 50,000 people in an Ohio prison, you can attend educational work programming administered by the DRC, and you can earn up to 8% off your prison sentence, an 8% cap. And of the 39 other states that do this, Ohio's cap is by far the stingiest. It doesn't create meaningful incentives for people to attend these work programs, for people to attend these educational programs the way that it could. So what issue one does is it increases that cap to 25%, not for all folks who are incarcerated, uh, but, but for many of them. And what this will do is it will help these folks get an incentive um, for every day of work or school pro programming they attend, they can get up to half a day off of their prison sentence. As we know, failure to become employed, um, get stable housing, earn money, is one of the key indicators of recidivism. And so something major that this does is helps us welcome back formerly incarcerated folks into our communities sooner, but with more skills, so that they can stay in our communities and not go back into the system. The second thing that issue one would do uh, would be to ensure that minor probation violations couldn't get you sent back into prison. So there are 50,000 people in prison now, right? But they aren't the same people year to year. Many of them are getting out and cycling back in. And, and in many cases, that's because people have committed minor probation violations. So if you're a practitioner, you know this. Um, if I am on a probation sentence in Cleveland, there are you know, 88 counties in the state and more jurisdictions than that where I could be serving probation. And each of these has a different system, a different set of requirements that I have to cope with. Maybe I don't, maybe I'm uh, using public transit to get from place to place, maybe I have a family to deal with. And if I miss a meeting with a probation officer or I miss a drug test because I'm dealing with drug addiction issues, I can go right back into prison. And that's not helping me deal with any of my issues. It's not helping my community when they lose me again. The third thing that issue one does is it creates sentencing reform for drug possession charges. And I want to be really clear about this aspect of the constitutional language because I think that this is where we're seeing a lot of that really fearful and inaccurate rhetoric. So what it does is it takes the current uh, framework for low-level felony drug possession and use type charges, and it reduces the sentence from felony four and five to a misdemeanor charge. And on your first two charges, uh, you can't be put away. And then subsequent to that, you can't be put away into prison. Okay, and this, this accomplishes a couple of things. Again, as practitioners know, it's a huge difference between having a misdemeanor conviction and having a felony conviction on your record. And this, again, is a key indicator of recidivism. If you have a felony record, the collateral consequences attendant to that include uh, employment limitations, travel limitations, limitations on your ability to participate in civic society. And so this would help those nonviolent, low-level drug offenders uh, get out without a felony record. The other thing this does, and, and in some ways more importantly, is it helps us reframe the way that we're looking at drug possession and use. Um, it's, it's widely recognized now that the way to combat drug addiction, which is a mental health disability, is not through the criminal justice system. And I understand and I, I sympathize with judges who are on the bench seeing this every day. And maybe they don't have alternatives, but maybe they only have a hammer so everything looks like a nail. But we know and research shows us that this is a healthcare issue. And funding treatment facilities is the way to deal with this issue. Now, we used to think that people with other mental health disabilities should be institutionalized, should be erased from society and locked up, and that that was the only way to deal with those folks. We now regard that as seriously outmoded thinking and, and an oppressive model of thinking. And we need to move to that same way of, of thinking with folks who have drug addiction disabilities, that treatment is the answer to that, and that punitive mechanisms are not the way to get people 
to treatment. Creating treatment beds is the way to get people into treatment. And that brings me to the fourth thing that issue one is going to accomplish. Uh, an independent study by Ohio Policy Matters estimates that over $130 million a year in savings will result from the decarceration that's going to come from passing issue one. And in issue one's text, the constitutional text that's proposed, um, it, it would require the OGA to funnel that savings into the following categories. 70% would be passed through the state mental health and addiction agency back into local communities that currently don't have options. And we see this all the time. They don't have options to put people in treatment, uh, in the kind of treatment that they need. And 70% of the savings from this amendment would fund that. 15% would go to fund the current criminal justice framework, and 15% would go to victims. Now, these are the four major ways that Issue 1 is going to help Ohioans right now, and it's going to help us set up a model for the future. In addition to that, Issue 1 has provisions to help people that currently are serving time for these felony uh, possession charges apply to their sentencing courts for a sentencing modification so that they can be considered under the new framework. Um, I, I finally, and, and I would be happy to talk with anybody about how this is going to work and, and actually how the, facially the amendment reads, but I want to tell you how it got to be a constitutional amendment and why this is important. The Ohio Constitution contemplates us doing this. We have a constitutional mechanism for uh, initiative and referendum. We've had hundreds of thousands of Ohioans in the state work carefully to get this onto the ballot. And that, that is something that the Ohio Constitution provides for. So this is the people's voice. And, and we, the people, understand the problems that are going on in our communities. Um, I'm 28 years old. I can't think of anyone in my age group, myself included, that hasn't had friends and loved ones die from the drug addiction crisis. No matter where you're from in Ohio, no matter who you are, you are going to funerals in high school for this now. This has obviously been happening with black and brown folks in this state since the war on drugs. And uh, maybe it's politically viable to talk about it now that the opiate crisis is perceived to be a white issue. Um, it's not a white issue. It's killing everyone. Um, and though having come to it this way is a problem, the only way to end the kind of incarceration and the kind of death that we're seeing now is by taking a bold step like issue one. This is what people in Ohio want. And the Ohio legislature has failed to act. For three decades, the Ohio prison population has steadily gone up. Uh, our prisons and jails are overcrowded, our treatment facilities are inadequate, and the General Assembly has consistently failed to act. Uh, the Ohio Criminal Justice Recodification Committee, is failure. Prior to that, Constitutional Modernization Committee, failure. Sentencing reform, failure. And I can tell you from my practice at the ACLU, that the OGA is really too busy working on abortion restrictions that they know to be unconstitutional to focus on meaningful sentencing reform. So this is something that I wish the General Assembly and the state would have moved on. They've had time and they haven't. We have a crisis that's going on now, not at some point in the future. And if you're not looking at it that way, you're not in the community where you need to be. Uh, so I, I don't understand why the Ohio Judicial Conference has come out with this parade of red herrings uh, urging folks to vote no. But the ACLU, uh, the Ohio Justice and Policy Center, the Alliance for Safety and Justice, and the folks on the ground in the state know that this is the right way to go. So I'm really happy that we're here having a discussion today, and I'd love to have you vote yes on issue one next month. Thank you both for your remarks. Um, at this time, we would like to open it up. There's any questions? There's, there's quite a bit. Uh, I'm going to have a microphone. Yeah. 
Justice, you uh, mentioned that uh, it was difficult, that you said it was impossible to take language out of the Constitution. So my question to well, you, well, yeah. that's what you said. Okay. So my question to you, what percentage of the vote is necessary to put language in the Constitution, and what percentage is necessary to take it out? It would take another constitutional amendment to take it out. Right, so but it's, you, the same, you it's the same number of votes. Yeah, sure. Okay, I just want, so it can't come out. That's my question. Well, yeah, and, and, and one of the proponents in one of these other exchanges was uh, uh, acknowledging this, this thing's a mess, it's a drafting mess. Uh, the notion that 700,000 Ohioans looked at this and decided, oh, this is what we want. It, it took me four times to have the patience to read through the actual language. The people who signed these petitions were handed a, a petition and said, are you for safe neighborhoods and safe communities? That's what they titled this. Well, who isn't for a safe neighborhood and safe community? So the notion that anybody that signed this understood what is in it is preposterous. Couldn't have possibly. I, I've been through it, I don't know how many times. Our judges have all been through it, I don't know how many times. And we keep finding new things that are going to be difficult, very difficult to deal with. Red herrings, that's preposterous. There are no red herrings. If this thing scares you, it should, because it's bad from start to finish. But, the, you know, We've not been saying anything that's wrong or dishonest or exaggerates. And I caution our judges, keep it honest. It's bad enough you don't need to stretch anything. Uh, the other side is stretching plenty. They've got John Legend up on a radio ad saying that half the people in prison are there uh, for low-level nonviolent offenses. Well, that, I mean, that, that's just couldn't be, and that's not John Legend's fault. He didn't write that. The proponents of this gave him that, said, go say this. Justice, I, I just want to set the record straight. I mean, I happen to agree that we should, it would be yeah. far better to have it go through the legislature. I don't like constitutional amendments for something like this, but I just wanted to set the record straight sure. on whether you could get it out or not. That yeah, was the whole point yeah. Of yeah. Well, sure, you can change the Constitution, but, but, that's a seems to me that's a silly exercise to say. Well, let's vote this in and out. then let's change it next year. Um, that's hardly a persuasive reason to vote for it. I I should respond to that briefly. All due respect, Justice Piper, um, you're wrong about the language, and I refer anyone to read it. I'm happy to send it along. Um, we've taken this language on the face of the amendment. Um, to hundreds of thousands of lay people in Ohio. Oh, come Any on. member of the bar will be able to read and understand what it does. Um, the Ohio Justice and Policy Center has an excellent analysis of what it does, where it um, pulls out parts of the text if you're having trouble understanding it. Um, but I refer you to that. It's, it's an excellent amendment. John Jones and uh, ACLU member. I came here really believing in the philosophy of the amendment, but very much concerned that we are using our constitution for local, for matters that shouldn't be constitutional. I mean, every single year we've got a constitutional amendment coming up, and that was the only reason I was going to vote against it. I now have I think reason to support we're voting against it from a very objective standpoint from what Judge Pfeiffer says. But what I am concerned about is no one doing anything about what the ACLU and the proponents are trying to do. Wasn't the Supreme Court of Ohio had a committee uh, or a, a committee by the Ohio Supreme Court and how we are going to deal with drug matters and that, where has that gone, if any place? Um. I'm not sure that I recall a Supreme Court committee on, on drug matters. Um, over the years, the Supreme Court's had a lot of study committees. Some have led somewhere and some haven't, like a lot of study committees. But I will tell you this. Uh, the Ohio Judicial Conference and judges, uh, and I've, I've been doing this 
for a year and a half. It seems a lot longer given uh, what we've confronted with this. Um, but prior to my being the executive director as well, the judge, the judicial conference has consistently resisted upping penalties in criminal statutes and testified and judges have come in and testified. Um, my first encounter was the Senate President Larry Alhoff. We got together at breakfast in Ashland, so I halfway between my house and his. And I talked about uh, the recodification committee, which was led by a judge, that looked at the entire criminal code, top to bottom, and made uh, this is a 4,000 page report, made recommendations on scaling down a number of offenses, scaling down some of the penalties on, on drugs. Uh, I indicated the judicial conference, uh, and I personally would uh, help with that effort. He wants to move that. The, they're in, at the moment, a, a bit of a, uh, of a problem in terms of leadership in the Ohio House. Um, Senator Alboff, the president of the Senate, described himself, Jeff described as a libertarian. Uh, he's passionate about bringing down prison population. He thinks we're, we are too high, uh, but he's also passionately against this. Um, because it is, uh, as the Elizabeth Sullivan at the point of it said, this is taking the chainsaw of the Constitution and to the problem. Uh, it, it, uh, for, for example, um, Elizabeth said, uh, you know, we want to welcome these folks back to our neighborhoods sooner. Well, that's, that's um, 6,500 people who are in for robbery. That's um, 21,000 that are in for crimes against persons. Um, and some of those people perhaps should come out early, but a lot of them are really bad, dangerous people that should not. And so when you say 25% across the board uh, in terms of early release, that's, that's a problem. But I'm confident the legislature is going to do more uh, and, and I will just, uh, in my last uh, email to our judges, I reminded them, um, dealing with the claims of the proponents, uh, claiming the legislature has done nothing to help for the past decade. The truth, the state of Ohio is investing over a billion dollars each year to help battle drug abuse and addiction, according to our Department of Health uh, report press release of September 27th of this year. Starting with House Bill 86 in 2011, including House Bill 49 this last year, which set up the TCAP program, which keeps judges from sending um, fourth and fifth degree felons uh, to prison unless the circumstances warrant it. And then this year with uh, Senate Bill 66, which Senator Eklund sponsored, we supported uh, gives a means for people who come out and behave and don't get more trouble to clean their record up and, and helps them become employable. So judges, you know, the, the prosecutors and law enforcement, they might have a different take on this, but from the judiciary standpoint, um, they take no pleasure in sending anyone to prison or jail, certainly not drug addicts. Uh, but it is their responsibility also to see that our, our communities are safe. And, and certainly they uh, consistently have been supportive of efforts uh, to help people who serve their time, whatever it is, um, and come out to help them to become employable again. Because that is a key. And uh, we probably even more adjustments in the law and in our attitudes in terms of offering employment opportunities for those who have made a mistake, sometimes a serious mistake, but seek to rejoin our society in a productive way. You know, I, I understand that, um, especially here in the history of members of the bar, have a concern about amending the Constitution. And I want to remind folks that it is built into the Constitution that we can do this, right? 
it's, it's, it's envisioned this way. We're not disturbing the structure of government to do things this way, right? We're using something that was contemplated by our state's constitutional framers to put this ballot initiative up. Uh, and, and so this is something that Ohioans who see the need have worked to do. And with regard to the General Assembly, there's no basis for confidence that they're going to do better. Um, they, they have a decades-long track record of failing to act. And as I said, we have a crisis that's not imminent, that, that we're in the middle of now. Um, this, is, this is a start to changing our framework of treating drug addiction from a criminal justice framework that we know not to work to a healthcare framework that we can begin to fund. Thanks for my questions. Um, Elizabeth, I have a question for you. As I listen to Judge uh, Piper's presentation and his statistics, it sounds like issue one might be a solution in search of a problem. And my question is, from the proponent side, is there a calculation of the actual number of inmates that would be reduced if issue one was passed as written? I think Justice Piper's numbers are, are correct. Um, we're their Ohio Department of Rehabilitation and Correction numbers. Um, and so this isn't, you know, many, many thousands of people today who are going to be let out. But but this isn't the only thing that issue one seeks to accomplish, right? It's not um, it's not, you know, some how I see it being framed is um, you know, you're going to change drug sentencing, and then you're going to let some drug offenders out, and then what about the sentencing cap? You know, you're going to let all, all these horrible folks out. That's that's not exactly how it works, right? Um, so it it addresses folks that are there now by uh, elevating the cap on earned credit, so that people can work towards reform, work towards getting an education, and rejoin the community. Um, it tries to correct the number of people going in with the sentencing reform piece and the probation reform piece. Um, so it works at it on, on both ends, and then it reinvests in community health services and community recovery services also to keep people out, right, and to keep people from going back in, and to try and give judges an alternative from sending people into the criminal justice system in the first place. But is it correct that under the current system that this issue seeks to change, the number of people who are in prison as a result of the current framework is something like less than 5% of the total population? That's right. That's exactly right. And and that's, um, you know, it, if we're operating on the premise that that's not meaningful, I really want to challenge that because these are human folks in our communities that don't need to be incarcerated and that need to come home. Um, and that's just a start um, in terms of what we need to look for in a future model. Hi, thank you for your presentations and for this dialogue. My question relates to um, amending the Ohio Constitution and the use or the lack of use of the initiative process. Um, I guess my question would be to uh, direct it to Ms. Bond. Uh, why was it that the proponents chose to go with a constitutional amendment uh, as opposed to um, amendments to the Ohio Revised Code for something that might be, uh, might be seen as a policy matter? Uh, as opposed to a matter relating to basic rights and the structure of government. So it, uh, I'm just wondering why the, the initiative process, uh, which is a more direct democracy process, isn't used more in, in Ohio. Why, uh, why go with the Trump card as opposed to uh, when the uh, legislature lays down the queen, why don't you lay down the king? And then if the legislature comes back with the ace, then maybe you use your Trump card. Why, why go straight to the Constitution for what might be seen as a policy matter? More generally, I guess directed to, uh, to both of you, um, you know, why isn't the initiative process used more in Ohio as it seems to be used? 
used more in other states for legislation, not, not initiated constitutional amendments, but initiated legislation. You know, I, I can't tell you why the initiative process isn't used more in Ohio, but I can speculate that it's because of what we know the General Assembly to do, and more importantly, to not do, right? The General Assembly has been consistently failing us on criminal justice reform. Um, so when you talk about preserving a, a theoretical structural framework of, of policy making, um, that, that framework it hasn't ever worked for us. And when you talk about um, waiting for the legislature to act or waiting for the legislature to, to play a queen and then we can have incremental reform and then maybe we can go back and forth, um, we've been waiting for many years. And they're not doing that, right? This is happening now. Uh, and so it's time for a strong, bold move now. And, you know, I, I also, I don't think any proponent would say that it's the only move, right? I think it's very important to be working on legislative reform, uh, to be working on voting rights, partisan gerrymandering reform, to be getting out the vote. If we want the Ohio legislature to work for us, I think that that's a very important thing to realize. And I'm really committed to that structure of government if we can realize it. But, but we never have. And as a result, we're suffering now. And so it's time for a bold step. Um, that's an interesting question of what uh, he's talking about. It's, uh, the other option, which was not selected, is to um, bring this as a legislative change, as was done in California, as was done in Oklahoma, where they, they had this both, both places, not constitutional amendments. And um, the process then is uh, you, you put together what it is, and I, I, my head's still spinning over thousands of people drafting this, but Stephen Johnson Grove keeps saying he drafted it. Uh, and I don't know which is, is, is the truth, but uh, I rather think it wasn't thousands. Uh, at any rate, they, they put together, say you took, took this, and then you bring it that way. As, as a proposed piece of legislation. The legislature has four months to tinker with it. Say, we're against it altogether, or we think these changes should be made, and we're proposing the, those changes and making those changes. Give it back to the petitioners, and then they uh, have a choice. They can go with the modifications that um, the legislature recommended, and it goes to the people for a vote, or they can say, no, we're it was perfect in the first place, and we want to take it to the public uh, in the form that we submitted. And uh, either way, then it's a vote, and, but it's a statute. Now, the, the reason that uh, in Judge Matthias' discussion yesterday with Stephen Johnson Grove at the uh, City Club um, that he gave is, oh, we couldn't trust the legislature they, if, if we did it that way. They change it in a heartbeat the next year. Um, I, don't, I don't think that's the case. Certainly not something that passed overwhelmingly. And uh, I know for a fact, uh, as Senator Alboff has described himself as pretty much a libertarian, uh, he has said to me that he thinks we're in the company of some of the worst countries in the world in terms of how many people we have incarcerated in, in relation to um, our population. Um, well, there's a guy with a gavel. Um, he may not be able to force the other house to do what he wants, but he sure can stop them from doing what he doesn't want to have happen and does on a regular basis. So the notion that if, if this were presented in that form and, it, and it, um, it would be changed like that the next session of the General Assembly, I think is just a, uh, a very false and, and weak argument to, in opposing the gentleman over here. Yeah. So uh, my question is kind of along the same theme of the last couple of questions. I, um, I'm wondering what legislative efforts have been made, for example, specifically, we've been talking in generalities, say over the past five years, what kind of proposals that go to these issues have been submitted to the 
legislature and that if it's been bottled up in committee, so be it. But I'd just like to hear specifically um, uh, whether any of the specific provisions that are proposed for the constitutional amendment have been propo proposed in legislation. And it struck me, I think you said that um, uh, maybe the number was $130 million in savings would occur. Well, that should be a pretty, you know, enticing number for the General Assembly and the, and the legislature to, you know, to glom onto if in fact is that kind of savings. So, you know, why, you walk me through what has been tried and has not been successful over the past, say, four or five years. Sure, you know, I, I can't tell you what other ballot initiative processes like that have, have been tried. Um, and, and have failed. I can tell you what hasn't worked in the General Assembly. Um, so we seem, and I'm troubled by this, we seem to be operating on sort of a benefit of the doubt that the Ohio legislature is going to do the right thing here. And what I what I want to hit home is that there's no basis for that uh, in, in recent history. Um, the criminal justice recodification effort that the justice referred to has failed. Uh, you know, many groups in the state, judges, prosecutors, defense attorneys, nonprofits, worked on that and, and tried to create some reform and um, came up with this wonderful recommendation, uh, set of recommendations. And the members of the General Assembly won't go anywhere with it. Um, similar with constitutional modernization. Uh, on the other hand, about 10% of bills introduced each year by the legislature would create new crimes or higher sentences. So we have a, a legislature that's taking things in the wrong direction, um, including with uh, drug reform. And we have an opportunity now um, to say we, we've given them enough chances and they're, they're failing us, or we're the constituents and they're failing us. It's built into the state constitution. Um, that, that we can take things into our own hands as, as we the people. You know, but you said we've given them enough chances. I'm trying to understand what some of those chances are. I don't know any of the specifics. Through the, you, you mean other groups having introduced similar ballot initiatives? Or, or, I can't speak to that. Or, no, 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 not ballot initiatives, but where people in these groups have gone, for example, to specific legislatures. Maybe they've gotten a sponsor from the minority party, you know, who's tried to advance and it's been quashed by the majority party. I don't know, I'm trying to get a sense of how I evaluate what you said, which we've given them lots of chances, the legislature lots of chances, and they've dropped the ball. You know, can, I, I'm looking for some specifics so I can understand the context of, of that, of, of, of why, you know, you see a lot of people who are troubled by going right to the Constitution, especially with uh, in a, a language of this magnitude. So I'm trying to understand what has tried to be introduced in the legislative process and has not gotten anywhere. You know, I, I also can't speak to, to other folks' efforts to lobby their legislators um, on this. You know, the ACLU lobbies in favor of really significant drug reform. And then I, I think one good example is the recodification effort. I, I would uh, indicate uh, I'm unaware of any legislator, Republican or Democrat, who has introduced any bill in the current session of the General Assembly. Uh, that would do any of the things that is proposed. So there had not been a bill introduced that's been blocked. Uh, <coughs> Elizabeth describes, well, we, uh, assuming that it's this is a large universe of people that are clamoring for this, um, I think there could be a healthy discussion about whether or not we ought to just totally decriminalize drugs in Ohio. There are some who think that. I served with Bill O'Neill on the Supreme Court. He thinks that. Um, but it's it's not a very big band that's marching behind them at this point. It is Zuckerberg and Soros and their money um, and, and a couple of small groups that are not very well known. I don't think the ACLE view has even proposed total decriminalization. And a follow-up to back there is to why is it always constitutional amendment and not a legislative initiative? It occurs to me in looking at the ones recently is because there was big money be behind doing it in the Constitution. There was a, a drug 
one this last year. Uh, before that, it was uh, uh, Peter was going to do something. So we got to animal care in the Constitution. You know, I have a lot of animals at home on my farm. I'm not too fond of seeing animal care regulated in the Constitution. You know, I, I should just respond to that briefly and, and say that um, th there's this idea that there are these out-of-state interests, right, you know, sort of, uh, they, they might, there's an insinuation that they're somehow predatory or that they don't know what's going on in Ohio. Um, and this is, I, I think, really disingenuous. Um, 700,000 Ohioans ha had to look at this and wanted to move. Um, and right, we're, we're not at the boat, but these are hundreds of thousands of people in our communities that we've spoken to, that we've worked with, that we live with, that want this to happen. Um, I, I would really like to know of an elected official in the state of Ohio that doesn't receive out-of-state funding for their campaign. Um, Me. <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> uh, you know, you know, but, but this isn't, there, there's not a sort of specter of some, you know, outside mysterious money interest that wants this to happen in Ohio. And it doesn't really make sense um, for someone like that to be informing a constitutional strategy over a legislative strategy. So we have something here that Ohioans want and need, uh, that Ohioans are getting behind. And we have a general assembly that we can't count on to do it. I think we have time for one more. Yeah, I just want to clear up some things about the General Assembly. I'm doing the tie I'm a part time carpenter. When I'm, not, <laughs> when I'm not busy hammering nails, I run our drug court and uh, try to redirect people towards getting their health back. Uh, I'm past president of the Ohio Common Pleas Judges Association. Uh, I was around when this recodification committee got started. Uh, it was an uh, exercise without a goal. It wasn't started with, like, we want to reduce the prison population. Let's do that. This was, let's clean up the language and the, and the code, and it just morphed into nothing. It was brought to you by Senator Faber, who was voted uh, a least liked member of the General Assembly by Columbus uh, Weekly. Um, the reason Paul Pfeiffer is sitting here as executive director of the Ohio uh, Judicial Conference is because Paul Pfeiffer, because Senator Faber, defunded the Ohio Judicial Conference because he didn't like Mark Swarkert so much. He made Mark Swarkert have to quit before he refunded the Ohio Judicial Conference. So that's a little history of the codification committee. On the other hand, this narrative that the General Assembly has done nothing is just false. Uh, as a common police judge, I cannot send a nonviolent, a non-sex offending, fourth or fifth degree felon to prison at sentencing now because of legislation that just was passed in House Bill 49 a year and a half ago, TCAP. The General Assembly has taken steps to try and keep low-level nonviolent offenders out of prison. I had, uh, years ago, early on the drug court, I had a, a team of primarily Republican members of the General Assembly come take a look at our drug court. I was prepared. I had several suggestions titled how the General Assembly can help. Make your doctor check the ORAS database before you prescribe an opiate. They took these and they all became laws. They act if you go talk to them. These folks did not talk to them. Also, this narrative that the prisons are full of nonviolent offenders is ridiculous. They're full of too many people, and that's that's sad. There's too many people committing crimes. There are Google ODRC institutional census and take a nice look at the numbers. They keep great numbers. As of January of 2018, there are 49,512 people in prison. 7,300 were serving the life sentences. 15,000 were there for first degree felonies. 11,686 were there for second degree felonies of the highest charge. 9,850 were there for third degree felonies of the highest charge. Combine low level felonies, the fourth and fifth degree felonies numbered less than 11% of the total prison population. 5,615. And I guarantee you that because of TCAP and the way we sentence in Ohio, those people were there because they had committed crimes of violence, like domestic violence, they were repeat offenders, or they did not comply with the terms of probation. This issue one is, again, a solution in search of a problem. It's not going to let the right people out of prison. We're going to let the first degree felons out of prison. We're going to let the people that hurt people out of prison. The only people excluded from the 25% reduction 
are rapists and murderers and the uniform crime of child molestation. That's not even a real crime in a lot. So you're gonna let people out of prison early who burn kids with cigarettes. You're gonna let people out of prison early who traffic in drugs. It's, uh, so I do have a question. My question is, of all of the newspapers who've looked at it in Ohio, why hasn't one endorsed your issue? You know, I, I've heard the judge, I heard him yesterday talk about burning children with cigarettes. Uh, uh, you know, that kind of scare tactic language never really seems to have any kind of principled stance underlying it in my experience. Um, what issue one is going to do is help people who are incarcerated get involved with meaningful and incentivized educational and work programming so that we can welcome them back into our communities, so that we can have the kind of functioning society that is only a dream right now. If you believe that this is a solution in search of a problem, you're not living in my community. I don't know where you are living, but you need to get in touch. This is a crisis. This is an opioid crisis and a drug crisis that's touching all of our lives, and this is a mass incarceration crisis that is hurting all of us in Ohio. And this is something that needs to be dealt with in a bold way and that needs to be dealt with now. And you know, maybe, maybe the judge and I do have different uh, premises that we're operating from. And so I, I want to welcome you to consider and to come to share my premise. And that's that we shouldn't be using incarceration as a retributive tactic at all. Um, we should be using it, if at all, as a rehabilitative tactic. And we've had some ODRC directors in the past that have been great reformers that have started to look at the prison system that is overcrowded in Ohio, that's keeping people locked up in way too many numbers for far too long, as a, as a real place of rehabilitation, but we're not even close to there yet. Um, giving people the opportunity to grow instead of just locking them up is what we need to be doing in the state of Ohio to move forward. Now, I hope you'll come to share that idea. I, I hope you'll vote yes on one in November. Just want to thank you to our speakers and for the uh, uh, spirited discussion today. Um, on November 13th, our November Hot Talks will be combined with our Veterans Day program. And uh, we just like to remind everyone to get out and vote on November 6th. Again, thank you both for being here today. And thank you for the great questions and dialogue. Thank you. Thank you.